Hello everybody and welcome back to another language learning log. If you don't know me already, my name is Mark and this is a project where I update you every two or so weeks on my progress with learning Japanese. The whole idea from the get-go was first half of the video, talk about a language learning principle, second half of the video, update you on my progress, but I wanna make these a lot more informal. Today, I'm trying to record three videos. Uh, so I'm using the webcam, so I apologize if I'm looking over here at the preview or uh, if some things are out of sync. I'll do my best in post to sync everything up. But today's learning log was supposed to be about vocab acquisition and some strategies to do that and then talk about my review. I've had a very productive last two days in terms of learning Japanese, so I wanted to talk more about myself. Plus, the whole process is for me to document this, to look back on, and pull from it. I really don't know anything about vocab acquisition except for what I've, you know, tried and experienced over the past couple of years. So before I begin though, if you're interested in learning a language this summer, uh, LingApp has offered to give me some free trials to give to you, the viewer, to give a shot uh, over the next few months or so. If you're interested, LingApp logo is here. You can find a referral link in the description down below, but for the free trial, all you gotta do is leave a comment down below and say what language you'd be interested in learning this summer. And alongside that, just tell me why you're interested in that. Why that language? What's your motivation there? So yeah, really quick, jumping into the stuff that I wrote out for vocab acquisition. This week has been, it was supposed to be jumping into kanji, but I've been behind. So I've been a lot, catching up a lot, but I'm still mainly working with this book here. If you're curious about my resources, you can check out language learning log number one, which will be here. And I can actually preview that this time. And I've made flashcards. I'll overlay a time-lapse of me making them. I recorded because why not? But I made flashcards for pronouncing hiragana and I have yet to go finish the katakana ones because I have not yet finished the katakana kind of in the book. Almost there though, gonna finish that today right after I finish recording this. I just got really excited. However, with something like kanji where it's very picture-esque, I think it's like 2200 kanji are used in daily life. You, I, I'm only gonna aim to learn 100 this summer, but you know, even that might be a lengthy goal. I think memorizing their meanings won't be that difficult, but learning the sound will be quite difficult. So when you're learning vocab, it can be easy and hard. I think one thing to look at are look for words that are cognates. So in French, banana is une banane, pretty similar words there. Something not as similar is voiture, is car in French, but doesn't really have a semblance in English. Uh, in Japanese, on the other hand, uh, katakana is a whole phonetic system that is largely used, if not only used, for words borrowed from other languages. That's how I would spell my name in Japanese. Whereas hiragana is for Japanese words and particles. Anyway, that being said, find those cognates, see what words you need to know. Uh, another general rule that I think you should follow is keep in mind that to know 80% of a language, you only really need to know 20% of the vocabulary. I am considered business proficient in French, but if you take me to a conversation that is in something remotely niche, I won't know many words. <laughs> I only know like 10% of French vocab, even then that's probably huge. But you know, it's a general idea of like, know the most common stuff and start there. Because when you learn the most common things, you're A, you're making things less scary for yourself. And B, you can get yourself speaking sooner rather than later. When you know just the basic words, you can practice speaking. And all of a sudden you might find a conversation or a reading passage and you're like, huh, I don't know that word. You look up the word, you already know, you know, maybe it's a verb, you already know how to conjugate it, all that kind of stuff. So learn those base foundations first. You don't have to learn all of the words. So that being said, uh, three strategies for vocab acquisition, just because I wrote them down that I will be using in the coming months. Uh, number one is language learning apps. Now I've made a whole video about this. God dang it, <laughs> here. And I think language learning apps are most strongly used when you're trying to memorize words and phrases. Language learning apps can be fantastic. Something like uh, Duolingo you know, has trees, so you build off of base. Apps like LingApp will build off of different categories. So you can go around and look at all the different categories. It's personally what I love about it. There's nothing holding you back from going to an obscure category, especially as a tool in your toolbox, uh, learning you know, obscure vocab, Perhaps in this book, I'm learning that 20% of vocabulary. I'm using Quizlet flashcards, TV shows, and reading and grammar resources to build up a basic vocabulary. But LingApp on the side will teach me some of those more niche things. And, you know, I don't think that a language app can teach you language, especially not as an adult, and especially not in five to 10 minutes a day. But if you really sit there and pull it apart and especially dig into the vocab, I think it can be a wonderful, wonderful tool. The second thing is kind of the less fun version is flashcards. Um, so something like Anki, or again, I'm using Quizlet for hiragana and stuff, is simply 
memorization. Now the key thing here is that eventually you want to remove the translation in your head. The main idea with flashcards and spaced repetition is that you want to eventually, through usage, remove the middleman of translation. For example, if I want to think of what a car is in French, uh, perhaps I want to say, I have a car, j'ai une voiture. I might say, okay, I know, you know, I know I have, j'ai. Uh, it's, okay, a car, feminine car, une voiture. Well, I have to think about the translation. And eventually that's where you wanna go, right? And flashcards and space repetition can be a great thing for this. Here's the forgetting curve, the classic forgetting curve. If you don't know about this, I'd highly look into, mem uh, bring, into looking it, into it. But the idea is you keep bringing up words and terms and vocabulary over time when you will be most likely to forget it. And that's how you will remember it, remember it the best. And lastly, the third method is physical labeling. Just go around and put a sticker on your water bottle that says uh, bouteille d'eau. In French, that's water bottle. I have no idea how to say water bottle in Japanese. So maybe I should do that. Um, whether you have a labeling machine or it's just pieces of paper with you know, Sharpie and then you use masking tape, uh, not masking tape, packaging tape, like clear packing tape to go over it, whatever works for you. It's a great way to just pick things up and be like, oh yeah, you know, basic vocab word. Mm. Side note, speaking of bouteille d'eau, drink, hydrate. It's hot, it's 93 degrees for me today. It's hot, drink. Mm. Wonderful. I really need a light back there if I wanna do this in the future. God, it's so framey too. All right, maybe that's a little better. We'll see. <laughs> so yeah, language learning apps, again, great tool, I think, alongside everything else. Just going through LingApp or another app I've been asked to make a video on, which will be coming out in a few weeks, called Hey Lingo, sitting there and mindfully saying, oh yeah, I remember, no is a thing to combine two things. Wa is a particle. Pulling apart these things in language learning apps is a fantastic tool. Flashcards and space repetition, I know that I can, I'm gonna be on the subway a lot this semester, going back and forth between classes and work. Pull out my phone and just sit there and just remember the hiragana and katakana because it's so important important to me right now to be able to read and write in a language, especially one with the different uh, alphabet system. And perhaps I'll talk about that in just a minute. And lastly, physical labeling. Just go around and you do you. There's a great game out there called Influent. I'll put a link in the description down below. Uh, supports a lot of languages and it's essentially a 3D like house environment where you go around searching for words. I haven't played more than 20 minutes of it, but I think it's a cool tool. And I have a little misc tab in my script, so I'm just gonna read the notes from there. I think when you, as you learn vocab as, uh, and you expose yourself to podcasts and TV shows, it's a great way to learn common phrases because you can A, recognize things and hear how they sound. It's like, oh, here we go. And context clues. Oh, whenever a person uh, enters a house, they say, Tadaima and Okerimaisu. I don't know, it was the reality TV show I was watching. You, you, you just implicitly memorize these things because some things simply cannot be translated. And translation is never exact whole other topic. No such thing as arbitrary memorization. When you try to memorize words, think of images or sounds or something that'll help you most. I kept forgetting the word auditory in the last learning log. But if I can, my idea for kanji, the first thing I'm gonna try when I get there is to associate an image with the kanji. Kanji for something and the strokes will visually rearrange themselves to be a picture of that thing. If it's a concept a little more difficult. But anyway, I'm very good at that. I'm very good at memorizing things, especially when it's arbitrary. During French class in high school, I would just memorize a list before the quiz and then forget it all after and ace the quiz. Long list of items can be linked together. I'm gonna leave a TED talk link in the description by Gabriel Weimer. Great TED talk definitely give it a go. So yes, my week in review. I, last weekend, there was no learning log. Uh, this, this is why this is a week late. Next week will be on time, I hope. I revisited Rosetta Stone at one point and it was super cool. Again, similar thing with Russian happened where I could actually read what was on screen. I looked up a small grammar guide from fluentin3months.com and I learned a ton already, just the different particles and whatever. Um, for example, if you're talking about a thing, you use kore, I, and I could be wrong 50-50 here, if the thing is near someone, near who you're talking to, the subject, I think, and you use a different particle to talk about if the item is near you. Japanese is infamous for their subjectless sentences. Maybe I'll talk about more of this in the future about grammar, but yeah, I'm gonna make the learning logs a lot less structured. Stuff just is gonna be on screen, just like this. I, I like it more. It's more casual, plus I'm the professional. There were other things I wanted to mention. I finished the hiragana section. Now, what's cool about Japanese, and this is something that I think is, if you're learning Japanese, pay attention. If you put, you know, a symbol out there. So let's go ahead and say ka. Mark, throw these up on screen, please. So ka, if you add a single quotation to that, um, it becomes ga. Now in 
phonetics, this is voiced and voiceless sounds. The easiest example that I can think of is perhaps not Japanese, but fu and vu. They are the same exact mouth anatomy, so to speak. Your T, it's a bilabial, um, no, dentolabial partial stop or something. <laughs> anyway, you make the same position with your mouth. The only difference is there's a vibration in your vocal cord. So f f many languages do things like this. And so all of a sudden when I look at this, it's like, oh my God, I have to memorize all these new sounds in hiragana and katakana beyond the 46. No, you actually don't. Ka, ki, ku, ke, and ko are all ga, gi, gu, ge, and go, which is the voiced sound. G, g is the voiced version of k, similar to v being the voiced version of f. I'll talk more about this in a future phonetics thing, but very important thing to note, I think. So yeah, I finished the hiragana stuff. I've been watching a little anime, but not enough. Definitely need to be watching more Japanese, like real live action is the word I'm looking for, live action TV. I will say my progress has been a lot more these past couple of days. I felt more incentivized. I'm coming ever much closer to, I'm coming a lot closer to being able to read the first part of this. And what's nice, and again, Mark, in the future, please overlay um, a picture is that when, so it has the Japanese and it has the English translation. Um, at the end, it has a list of all the vocab you need. And for all the kanji, there is hiragana up top for pronouncing it. Cause I know that, or at least I believe one of the most difficult things for me is not going to be remembering what kanji means, but pronouncing it. As I mentioned in the last learning log, I'm a much more visual learner, um, not a great auditory learner. So remembering what they sound like will be rough to say the least. <laughs> My goals for this upcoming week is to finish the katakana section and all of the voiced and voiceless stuff. Then after that, I'll do the final review section in this book. Um, so this should be done by the end of July latest. This will be done by the end of July latest. So next week, in other words, I will be done with the katakana section and the voiced and voiceless sounds for both hiragana and katakana. For some reason, I skipped it for hiragana because I thought it'd be easy, but there's a little more nuances than what I had mentioned about the voice voiceless thing, but still important to know. That's kind of my main goal right now. The next learning log is meant to be about syntax and grammar study. So perhaps I'll look more into the Japanese grammar. Um, duh. I found this great Japanese grammar guide by Tay Kim. It's 353 pages long. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to sit down and read this, but it's a great textbook. Just looking at it, we have various sounds, we have conjugations, we've got particles, everything I've been looking for. I think it's a great resource and hopefully by the start of August, I'm going to be able to start practicing speaking Japanese. So that's my mid to long term goal. And by the end of August, I want to take a JLPT exam. Japanese learning proficiency test, I believe it stands for, just to see where I'm at. Obviously, I'm not going to be fluent, but I want to be able to read hiragana and katakana with very little hesitation. It'll still be slow, but I want to be able to look at it and be like, okay, I know these sounds, or at least be able to recall them without having to look back, you know, and, and then later down the line, I don't have to think this symbol is ah, uh, or looks like an A in my head, then, I, then it becomes ah. Uh. So this to this to ah. Uh. So then I can just take out this middle part and it immediately goes to ah. Uh. Again, the implicit memorization thing I mentioned. But yeah, I think that's about it. So that's it. Um, gonna definitely look into more of the Japanese grammar as the week goes on. Absolutely huge fan of this so far. I did reach a moment of Mount Stupid when I was reading through the grammar guide because I was like, this is easy, dude. And so here's a graph of that, but it's good to be there because Mount Stupid is a wonderful place to be sometimes. You think you know everything and it's as soon as you crash coming down from that mountain, it's. It sucks in the moment, but it's so good to look back on because you're like, wow, I really thought I knew that. Hilarious. Anyway, yeah, so that's it. Let me know if you would like this new format, new format of the learning logs. I'm gonna keep it much more lax. I'm definitely gonna talk about stuff in the first half. So like I did with vocab acquisition, but a lot more chill. Um, the next week will be about grammar and syntax study, but nothing too intense, obviously. And then I'll jump into my own progress because again, this is largely for documentation. So definitely leave your own comments down below. Again, if you're learning a language and you're interested in a free uh, trial of LingApp, let me know, leave a comment with what language you're learning, why you've chosen that language. I'll be in touch. All I will end up needing is an email. If you're not working on a language and want to post other goals, you can do so in the description down below. I also have a Discord server. It was way before the channel, but uh, a lot of people have been posting goals and working on things. So if you'd be interested in joining, we'd love to have you. The more, the merrier. It's a nice small community right now, very close knit. Anyway, enough of me talking now. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one. And as always, don't forget to stay awesome. I will see you next Saturday.